following interview was conducted with James Blakemore, Professor Emeritus of Veterinary Clinical Sciences for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, August 28, 2009 in his residence in West Lafayette. This is part two of the interview. Welcome and good afternoon, Dr. Blakemore. Thank you. Good afternoon to you. Thank you. We'll continue on with the um, dogs and the hypothyroidism and the pet allergies. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Hypothyroidism is actually a very common problem among dogs, uh, and the thyroid hormone is very important because it tends to be a regulator for almost everything that your body does. So, for example, if you have adequate thyroid hormone, you grow hair at the right rate. If you don't, you may not even grow hair or various things in between. And the same thing is true for muscle strength. The same thing is true for uh, energy and activity. And so the classic description of hypothyroidism is poor hair coat, overweight, inactive, a lot of sleeping, and uh, also generally more susceptible to infection because the hormone also activates the immune system. So it's a very important metabolic regulator. Right, just like similar for humans too. Is the from... same, it's the same exactly. Right, mm -hmm. okay. So you did some research in, with, the, with the dogs and that? We did and, okay. and found that to be often a, an important underlying cause for other problems. And, and in fact, that became one of our philosophical approaches in, in our hospital is that while we are dealing with the obvious, we need to be looking for the underlying causes and de identify those and manage those and lots of times the things that have been treated symptomatically before resolve because now you're attacking the actual cause. Right. Okay. And that's a, a very good principle that we started early to preach and teach. And the, I, I, Get down to the crux, the bottom line. Exactly. And, and one, of the, one of the interesting things that, that, that uh, occurs to me is that it almost for a while seemed to me like dogs had been genetically selected for hypothyroidism because if you wanted a dog that was docile that would just lay by the fire and be very peaceful and quiet when you wanted it quiet that that kind of sounds like hypothyroidism and so I think that there may have been some genetic trend in that direction, and that's one of the reasons it's so common. Hmm. Is there any species, any dog that it doesn't is not as common as in others, or is there? Is no, there pretty, pretty pretty widespread. Okay. Uh, golden retrievers are one of the breeds that are, are really affected by it, and I can remember a time when a gentleman came who had an antique shop with actually very exquisite antiques, and he is a, a golden retriever. He complained because she was overweight, her hair coat was poor, she was, wasn't very active, and he was worried about her health, and so she did indeed prove to be hypothyroid. So we got her on to treatment, which is basically the owner administers hypothyroid, or administers thyroid hormone every day. And you basically become the dog's thyroid gland in the process. Mm. And so he was administering it faithfully, and one day he called me and he says, do you know, does my dog really have to have this or would would she be okay if we didn't give it to her? And I said, why is that? And he says, because now it used to be she'd raise her head and watch people come and go. Now she's all over the shop. She's wagging her tail. She's breaking stuff. And he said, this isn't quite what I had hoped for. <laughs> she's acting her normal self. Right. Exactly uh -huh. right. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, pet allergies. Allergies. Common sense will go a long way in helping manage pets' allergies. Well, that does, and I think we talked a little last yeah, time about right. about th when you're dealing with an allergic pet, for the owner and everybody else is to think in terms of where is the threshold uh, for that that patient's sensitivity, and if their provocations are always below the threshold, they'll be fine. If the provocations exceed the threshold then they will show symptoms. Like right now we're into ragweed pollen season and so that provocation is breaking the threshold in many dogs and people of course and so then the symptoms appear. And, and the converse of that is when we're dealing with management if the owner can reduce the total, prov and it's, it's a sum not each thing individually, it's a sum total 
So if the owner can reduce the overall provocation below threshold, uh, they may have to do very little else. So for example, let's say the dog is allergic to feather dust and to some of the pollens, uh, by removing feather dust from the household, by getting rid of feather pillows, for example, you can bring the provocation a long way down. And then if uh, when the dog is outdoors and picks up pollen on the feet or in the hair coat, when it comes in, if they can wipe it down, that will bring down the overall provocation. And so you get, try to get as close to the threshold as you can or below threshold. When you get as far down as you can and you still have symptoms, that's when you start thinking in terms of allergy or of medications for the allergies, including everything from antihistamines to uh, uh, injections, allergy shots. Yeah. Are dogs more allergic to al have more allergies than cats or? Dogs uh, seem to be more bothered than cats do, but cats are more bothered, I think, by food allergies. So they can have some real problems with that foods, and, and it's not just GI or digestive tract that's involved. Uh, that does tend to make their skin uncomfortable, and sometimes they will just tear themselves up because right. of it. It's interesting on cats. I've had some people over where they say that it does, doesn't bother them, but somehow or other the cat seems to know that and sort of seems to gravitate towards uh -huh. them, you know, and they yeah. sort of, you know. <laughs> the people who are allergic to cats. Yeah, uh -huh. They're a little bit. They don't mind them, but for some reason the cat says, I think maybe I'll just make a little visit over there and, and shake hands or something. I'll follow uh -huh. the white light. <laughs> um, the, uh, let's talk about a little bit of your administration things. The chief of the small animal medicine, uh, mm -hmm. what did that involve? Well, I was, uh, for In a time I was interim head of the department, and for okay. a time I was chief of small animal medicine. Sure. Those tend to be... Uh, a lot more administrative responsibility and making sure that the staffing is present for office hours and for teaching, obviously, uh, and to be sure that people are able to develop themselves along with the, the development of everything else that takes place. And there are, there are lots of things that need to get resolved. Uh, for example, medical records, when we started with the three of us and that one lady in the front office, a medical record was a five by seven card. And like it had, catalog cards. Right, <laughs> and, exactly, and it had very little on it. Now, as your work has changed with electronics, obviously so has ours, and among the things that I was, was very interested in was making sure that our medical record was uh, appropriate and useful and available. And that means a lot of things. Sure. Right. And as, as a retrieval became possible, then we, of course, developed that further. The first, the first system that I, that I located that we used was called Termatrex. And what that was is that there, was a, there were sets of about uh, 12 by 12 cards with a kind of a plastic material that could be drilled and the machine we had was, was very carefully calibrated so that there were 10,000 potential holes on a card, if, depending on the exact location you put it to. And so there was a card for male, a card for female, a card for canine, a card for feline, and then from there it went on to more and more and more detail so that, for example, to code a record, the, the technician that was working with it would pull out the card for male, the card for castrated, the card for canine, the card for German Shepherd, and then the card for whatever disorder was involved, was it vaccination status and all that sort of thing. And then you put that stack of cards in the machine, dial up that particular patient number, and then drill through all those cards and created a hole. So the way you use those cards, it would be Supposing you wanted to know, for example, uh, what percentage of our, pa or how many patients did we have and which ones were castrated male German Shepherds. And if that's all you want to know, well, you just pull those three cards, you put them on the light box and where the light came all the way through, that told you that particular instance. So we could use it for statistical things, for medical data, uh, and for, also tracking our activity. Sure.
Right. So that was the Termitrex. Well, that lasted for several years, actually, but then that obviously became outdated when we started to get to digital. And so then we joined in with uh, the National Medical uh, Database for Veterinary Medicine. And in fact, we have that uh, headquartered here at Purdue. And so there are 12 uh, schools, I think, that participate and provide their clinical data. And they're available. You have them, you have them here. Uh, we have the, the data okay. here. And so if a researcher wants to study a particular problem, they can ask for a printout of the data for that particular disorder, including location, incidence, breeds affected, is there a difference in between sexes, uh, age range, and it goes on and on and on. So it's a very nice, it's the National Veterinary Medical Database. And uh, we were very early involved in that, and, and that's why it wound up yeah, uh, being here. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's good. It reminds you a little bit, remember the key sort cards? They must have been similar. Uh, uh -huh. You could run a, a wasn't, we didn't use a machine, but you could, Run a needle, spins, the needle through the whole. Needle through it, and then uh -huh. the ones would drop out yes. that have been slotted to that. Yes, particular I have thing. some of those cards here still. I do too. I have uh -huh. some at home. Uh huh. <laughs> um, Indiana University Medical Center adjunct professor of dermatology. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little about that. Uh, before we come to that oh. one, can I tell you sure, a couple ahead, more things sorry. about when I was administrator? Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, during the time that I was in charge yeah, of the evaluation to and certification. Pardon me. The evaluation certification by the American Animal Hospital Association, 1988, when you were yes. in, uh, mm -hmm. in teaching hospital. Oh, so. yes, we should get into that. Yeah. But uh, among the kinds of things that, that I did as, as administrator, one of them was to contact the people that we had chosen for internships and, and residencies. That was part of my job. After What would happen is we would get applications for those positions, and then we'd go through those. We'd make some decisions, come up with the people we wanted, and uh, list them in order. And then it was the department heads or the chief's job to contact the individuals and invite them to for an interview. You no, know, to accept the position oh, okay. at that point. And so, uh, one year, uh, I called uh, Ralph Richardson, who uh, had who. Well, this was for an internship. Well, his name will come up many times more, but we, he had applied for the internship and he was, he was serving in the army in Korea. And so I was on the phone trying to contact Ralph and I didn't realize that it was 3 a.m. in Korea when I placed the call. And so here poor Ralph got a call three o'clock in the morning from the States and he had no idea what kind of an emergency that might be. But it turned out that I was calling to invite him to accept an internship at, at our uh, at our institution in our in our small animal clinic, and so Ralph did accept that, and he did come, and he was an internship, and he was a wonderful intern, a real real asset. Well, then, as often happens with things like this with the quality people, uh, is he then went in on to a, for a residency and got some advanced training in that. And then he decided he wanted to try private practice. So we, we were trying to keep him here. Uh, here as the faculty member because we then had a position. And he wanted to try private practice, so he went to Miami into a very nice practice, and he was there several years. And every time a position would open, I would call Ralph and invite him to interview. And he kept saying, no, no, I can't do that. And so then, uh, Finally, what happened is he decided, well, okay, I might as well do this, give this a shot. So he accepted our offer of a position and came here. And then he was here on the faculty for several years and, in fact, became head of the Department of Clinics eventually. And now he's dean at uh, Kansas State. So, you know, it's really, it's really interesting to be able to follow somebody through their career that closely and right. be involved in it. Right, yeah. So that, that's the kind of thing that, that and then there's, there's one other story that I just have to include, and, and that is that our students are, are, all of them, very, very high quality individuals. 
And this goes back to earlier in, in our years because at first we had uh, rooms on the second floor over the small animal clinic. And those were dorm rooms. And we had some students living in those and the requirement was that they would answer the doors or the phones at night by going through rotation uh, to do that. And so one day I found out that uh, their, their kids had caught some people who shouldn't have been in the building taking name plates off doors and stealing them and then leaving. Well, they caught them in the act. And so they told them, they said, you guys are in real trouble and they kept a driver's license. And they said, I want you back here tomorrow evening at six and you're gonna to have to talk to Dr. George. And so those poor scared kids came back and Dick George was a big tall fellow and he had on a white coat and they escorted them into some vacant office and, and he told them, he said, you know, he said, what you've done is actually a crime. And he said, you could be punished severely. He says, but we're going to give you a chance to make amends. He says, we're going to have you come over here and do things like clean cages and wash glassware, and that sort of thing. And for three weeks, those students had those kids doing their jobs. <laughs> it, was good. it was good. It was good. That's right. And so it was very imaginative and, and very creative, and it was a good solution to it. <laughs> very good. Very good. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead then. What uh, you want? To, what is next well, to the uh, IU? Well, if you wanted to get into the accreditation thing. Oh yeah, that one there when you were the when small uh, the interim director of small animal. Right. Right. Okay. Uh, what happens is that there are several agencies that accredit our programs, sure. including the American Veterinary Medical Association, for overall accreditation of our educational program. But for things like the hospital. That's uh, more closely related to American Animal Hospital Association, and we wanted to have their accreditation uh, just so we were satisfied that, that we were doing the job as well as it could be done. And so we did ask them to come and do an accreditation, and they sent some of their national officers, and they did interview us, they did look over our medical records, looked over uh, all of the systems that we use, our protocols, and all that sort of thing, in terms of hospital operation. Sure. And uh, then from that, they, accredit they gave us accreditation as a certified hospital. That's nice to have that certification. That's very nice to right. have. That, that, Particularly that, since it's grown so much. You have other services as well as mm -hmm. a hospital. That tends to mean a lot. Sure. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. Do they, but they give you a little bit of a heads up don't they, um, before they come, so you know? Sometimes they do a preliminary or... Well, if it's the American Veterinary Medical Association, it's every seven years, oh, and okay. you know that it's coming, right. okay. and you have to send them a preliminary collection of information sure. and materials. Which they share with the, the, the team that's going to be coming. Exactly. Right. Uh, for the American Animal Hospital Association, it was just related to the hospital operation itself and the quality of care we offer and for that, they did ask for some preliminary data, but not quite in the same way as the AVMA does. Yeah, okay. That's mm -hmm. very good, though. And you, you passed. Oh, we did. We, got, <laughs> we did get certification. Yeah, I read something. You were very pleased. Well, we did our work correctly. <laughs> well, and, and in fact, we went out and asked them to do that. Okay. That wasn't something that they routinely no, do. Uh, but we asked for that because we wanted to be satisfied that we were doing our job as best as we could. And, and what happens is that there's a conflict in a teaching institution between the demands of teaching and the demands of uh, efficient patient care. Because if you didn't have students to teach, you could you know, see a lot of patients and do a lot of things and do them very quickly. But when you get students involved, and our policy has always been to let the students do as much as they possibly can under controlled circumstances and, and give them as much freedom as is reasonable. And so that does take time and it's a very different, uh, very different setting than, than say in just a strictly sure. private practice. Good point, yeah. And, and it was very important to us from day one when there were just the three of us that the students would learn to do everything they could do and to have every opportunity to do that and to be treated with respect and and care.
Right, and so they were, when they graduated, they were really ready to move on. And we think that we right. do that job better than anybody. Sure, right, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay, do you want to talk a little bit about some IU? About IU, yes, I do. Uh, what happened is that while I was... Um, that started, excuse me, it'll be about 1974, I mm -hmm. think, and they Early, came on campus yeah, somewhere. In the, the 70s. The date sticks in my mind. Uh -huh. Well, what happened is that, that as we developed our interests... We were looking for ways to to educate ourselves in our specialties because at that time there were not residencies or specialty training uh, available mm -hmm. in clinics. There were graduate degrees, but not cl advanced clinical training. And so one of the things that I did is to make contact with the people in dermatology at IU, and they were very interested in that, and so they invited me and and I would go there about, uh, oh, two days a month, I suppose, maybe one day a month is about all we could manage. But uh, they just included me right in their activities and and encouraged me and helped me find materials and things like that. And so that evolved to the point where they offered me the ad adjunct professorship. Okay. So I, officially, I am a clinical adjunct professor at IU. and. And there are some things that they particularly wanted to hear from me about, and that was mostly to do with skin disorders of animals that affect people. And so we're into external parasites, uh, we're into, well, the allergies, because there's similarity there, and uh, but not directly transmissible. So, so it's basically things like fungal infections, parasites, bacterial infections, things of that sort. Mm -hmm. Did you do some research or, and teach, or just the teaching for the students? With, with IU, it was strictly the teaching part. Okay. Okay. Uh, and uh, but this all, was in, excuse me, in Indianapolis, not the Lafayette campus. That's in Indianapolis okay. at, at Riley. Um, and one of the things that they were particularly interested in is a parasite called Chiliotella. Uh, it's a large mite that lives on the surface of dogs and cats. Uh, it much prefers dogs and cats, but if it gets on people, it is very aggressive, and it will tend to migrate to places where there's a little back pressure, like under a watch band, under a belt, under undergarment type bands, and things of that sort, and that helps it, the, the skin's a little more warm and, and moist there, and it's easier for them to penetrate, and then they bite, and it's really itchy. And in fact, they tend to bite in three little bang, bang, bang. And the folks at IU always refer to those as BN, BLD lesions, which stands for breakfast, lunch, dinner. <laughs> and in fact, uh, that was not a parasite that was very well understood or taught to dermatologists. And a good example of that is that here on campus, uh, uh, one day there were some young ladies brought a cat to our clinic and they wanted it examined because they were pretty sure that was the res result re responsible for their itchy bites but they had they had been to physicians who told them no that's body lice they gave them all kinds of instructions about how to get rid of body lice mm. and the girl that's said stuff. the girl said no that can't that, that just can't be true and the history of it is that they were all fine until one of the girls was given a kitten by her boyfriend. And within a few days, uh, and it takes a very short time, within a few days she was getting these bites. And uh, then uh, she, was, she left campus for, to trip home for a couple of days. Another one of the girls took the kitten over and she got bites. And so it became real obvious to those girls that it had to be related to the kitten. And so, as, as it turned out, uh, we did find the mites on the kittens, and are in that kitten, and we were able to identify it as Chilotella, and I have a lot of pictures of that episode which have been used to teach physicians about Chilotella. Um, and those girls were so happy to find out exactly what the cause was that they said, you can take all the pictures you want. So we have lots of pictures of human Chilotella bites. Right. What, what sort of medication do you prescribe for that? For well, people? actually, for the people, it would be just something like cortisone or oh, something okay. to relieve the itch. 
uh, because the parasite will not survive on them long. But on the kitten, then we use pesticides to, yeah. to remove them. And one of the things that I did develop uh, as part of that was uh, a way to find those mites. And so I took a tube from a syringe case, a large syringe case, that would fit a vacuum cleaner hose. <clears throat> and then I cut a ring that would fit into it. Then we put filter paper over the ring, fitted that on, and then attached that to the vacuum cleaner. And then we would run that filter over the cat. And by golly, we were pretty successful at trapping, at trapping the shallow easily. telemites. Sure, mm -hmm. right. That's mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. Cats are interesting animals. Cats are very yeah. interesting. I, well, yes. I told you I have two of them. And right. When I had um, Vanilla, who was the diabetic, and when he was frisky, I don't know, I had to give him some pills. Well, you try different. You people are always the experts, but when you get them home, it's not that easy because they hide it and then they oh, spit yeah. it out. Right, that's not so, an easy uh, thing. So someone tried to suggest a food, so I tried that one day. You're not, I'm smarter than you are. They ate all around the food, and the sure. pill was right there. Exactly right. See, they're, I left it right there. They're you. very good I'm at it. I'm smarter than you are. <laughs> they're very good at it. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the School of Veterinary. The first class was shortly after you arrived, and you came. The mm -hmm. first class was started in 1959. A little bit about the curriculum right. and the school in the early days. Well, the, there was. it starts out, it's basic sciences for the first two years, so okay. that's basically anatomy lab or classroom work or physiology lab and classroom work and, and uh, all those, th and microscopic anatomy and things are strictly classroom work. So uh, when I came, we were just getting that first class to the third year, which is where we started clinics. But actually, since we didn't have any seniors at that point, those kids were both juniors and seniors in clinics, so they got a lot of hands-on right away. Uh, and uh, we tried to make it as interesting for them as we could, and we also tried to make it as real for them as we could. So our policy was to have the student go into the exam room, take the history, talk to the people, try to develop their own ideas about what was wrong, what should be done, and how to go about it, and then come back out and talk to us about that. And then we would go on from there. Sure. In fact, that evolved to uh, the medical record system known as the problem-oriented system because that's another thing that we added here early on and then other, others picked up on later and that is instead of having just a mess of paper in the record and a bunch of lab works and things or lab reports you have at the top of the pile what's called the problem list and so when the student would come out of the exam room they knew they had to have a problem list and so they would say well this cat is scratching uh, this cat has not had its vaccinations. This cat is not eating as it should, and the owners have bites on their waist. And you would say to them, well, that's interesting. Let's take these problems one at a time first. About the vaccinations, you know what needs to be done. And they say, yes, and we recommend this, and they write out the recommendation. And then we go down the list, and then when they could and then when they began to synthesize it, that the cat was scratching and the people had bites, then they put together a differential. And a differential diagnosis means that that's the list of things that would explain the problem that you now must differentiate between. And then from that, you select your, your diagnostic work and then proceed from there. So the kids came out of the rooms, uh, put together a problem list, uh, put together their ideas on what was wrong on the differential and how to sort out the things on the differential and then we would discuss it all and then go on from there. Yeah, very good. Good start. Well, yeah. it, 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 and, and with the early years they really got a lot of special extra training. They did and, and we really were determined that they would leave here prepared to deal with people on their own level. Right. And that, I think, that tradition has held sure. very well. Right, exactly. And then they had the, um, I mentioned this, I think, before the dedication of Lynn Hall in 1960. Okay. Your facility. Yeah. That the, was kind of nice. That, that was before, oh, the Lynn Hall, that was before my time. Yeah, they had that dedicated. And then the name change came in 74. It did, and, and there was some debating about. Well, there's always debate on things. Some about like this and what, some like that. Right. Some like a cold, some like a hot. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, and then um, 
the development has changed over time and advancement within the school and within the university. Oh yes, um, very much when so. When Baring was here, it was called Vision 21, and then of course mm -hmm. Chesky was the campaign for mm -hmm. Purdue. Well, for our school, the, the, the addition of development officers has been very helpful and very useful. Oh, I'm sure. And, and they well, are... through in the libraries, too. We didn't have anybody. Kathy mm -hmm. Potter was the first one that we mm -hmm. had that came over from the vet school. Mm -hmm. I remember Kathy. Yeah. yeah. And, of course, she's retired. She was the first one. Now we right. have Judy Shoemaker. Right. The deans that, now, when you came, Stockton was the dean? Yeah, Dr. Or, Mor or Morris? It was Dr. Morris. Morris, because, okay. Because Dr. Dean Morris uh, was the one that I had worked for at Michigan State right. as a student. Right. And when he had a position open, he remembered me and called me in the little practice I was in in Michigan and invited me to come. And I remember a cold winter week we were here uh, and the place was, was all new and, and so shiny and nice. And there was just John Annis and Andy Lavignette. So the three of us were able to, you know, kick around ideas together and, and uh, to start to, to create a philosophy that we could believe in and teach. Right, yeah, that's all. And then after that was Hugh Lewis. No, no, Jack, Jack Stockton. Stockton, then Lewis, right. Yeah, Sorry, and Jack right. Stockton, it, that's fun because... He came from Michigan State, He too. taught parasitology. Did you know him? Oh, yes. Oh, okay. Uh, he taught me parasitology, or he was teaching parasitology at Michigan State when I was a student. Oh, my Lord. In, in fact, that goes even further, and that is that when I was, when I got my draft notice, mm -hmm. uh, and I had, you remember, I had finished pre-vet, I got a letter accepting me to vet school, but I also got a letter from the draft board because Greetings. of the Korean War at the same time. Well, uh, I elected, of course, to, to serve my time. All my friends were going into service, and, and that was the patriotic thing to do, really, I felt, and so I did. But then when I got out and applied back to vet school, uh, I didn't hear anything, and I would call now and then. And I guess now maybe they had already decided to take me back in, but they wouldn't tell me that. And so I kept calling and calling, and poor Jeannie was, was pregnant and far along. <laughs> and uh, they decided that in order to, well, I told them I was going to come and camp on, on the campus if I had to, to, to so I could Let visit me. with them and, and, and plead my case. So... Finally, they said, okay, we have an interview set up for you. And so we drove down uh, to East Lansing, and it was Jack Stockton that had agreed to interview me. And I, for to this day, I bless that man for doing that because I don't know what else he had to do, but he took several hours to sit down with me and listen to me and talk to me and, and to interview me, at least to the point where I thought I was being interviewed. And uh, so it was, dude, God bless him, that was a wonderful thing to do. We had a great visit that day, and I remember him clearly because of all that. And so then about a, about a month, six weeks later, I got a letter saying I had been accepted sure. for the fall class. Do they do the interviews for the students? Uh, that are that apply at the vet school. Do they do interviews? Oh, absolutely. Oh, everyone is interviewed. Everyone that's a good is, point. I didn't realize that. Everyone is interviewed. That's another important part of our program, and we have been done. We have done that from day one, and that is that we sort through the applicants, pick out a list. You of have a, a committee that makes the yes, decision. Sure. yes, and pick out a, a prospective list that is more than the number of positions we have. And, and it's really very competitive. I tell you, you have to treat those kids very carefully because there's only so many vet schools in the country. And your and classes are limited as far as size. It, it, very limited in size. And so it's typically you have six to 10 kids per position applying. And That's by the time I mean. you go through that list and pick out the ones that are prospective, those are really, really good candidates. And so then when the interviews are held, the kids are treated with a lot of respect. Uh, there's a very distinct format for the interview. You do what you can to put them at ease because you know they're nervous as can be. Um, and in fact, the actually it, it's organized to do as much as possible to put them at ease. So before the interviews, there's a welcoming session, there's tours. Uh, 
parents. Because you could have more than one, do more than one interview in a day, so you might have a couple that are coming. Oh yeah, way okay. more than one. There's, sure. there's usually. So they could do be the tour together. Yes. Oh okay. Yeah, there's usually. Oh, I don't know what they're how they're doing now, but as I remember, it was around 20 kids okay. per okay. interview day. That's nice. So they can interact. Yes. Mm hmm. Is it on a, does it last what half a day or most of the day? Uh, their interview of. The, the specific interview with the committee is about a half hour. Okay. But the whole program with tours through the school and session with uh, people who can tell them about the school, about financial aid, about all those things, uh, uh, they're there pretty much all day. Yeah. And then they have a banquet for them at night. Very nice. Yeah, and, 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 nice. and that, that is nice. Uh, and what happens is that they get to meet also some faculty people and things yeah. like that. Do you do the interview? Are interviews also for the graduate program? Uh, many of those are interviewed for graduate degrees, but sometimes it's done on the basis of the application and checking uh, references and then phone. And where they're where they're coming from and what they're right, especially they're if they're from. overseas. Sure. Yeah. In the early days, did you have many? Inter international students? Mm, not very many. It wasn't. It was not. Most of them would be within the region here, within the not necessarily right. Indiana. Especially the first class, sure. because there was such a backlog of Indiana kids. Because there the, hadn't been a school. There had not been a school, right? And because the legislature was very, very interested in getting lots of Indiana kids in, the first few years it was pretty much all Indiana kids. Sure. No girls. But there were Indiana kids. That brings. I was going to ask about diversity. It's been an increase over time. That's been an interesting change. I remember that we lobbied some of us for getting girls in, and finally we got our first girl, and she was in the school. And sometimes your there's second class has the one that had the first two graduates. One of which was Carol Ecker. Am I correct? Right, in that? Carol. Yeah, and Carol has turned out to be a real blessing to the profession. She bleeds black and gold. She does, and she's and great school. for the profession. Right. Yeah, Carol is wonderful. Yeah. So I've interviewed Carol. Have interviewed, you? Yeah, oh, I that's her. good. Yeah. That's good. Well, she's a good example of the kinds of people we get. For goodness <laughs> sake. Uh, Go Boilers. Exactly. <laughs> but I can remember that first one. Uh, I think there was just one girl in, the, in that first time. And I remember when she was a senior one day, I asked her how it was going. And she said, well, she says, you know, what I really think is that you guys let me in because you figured I'd get pregnant and wouldn't compete with the guys. <laughs> I've, since then, she's changed her mind. But she still was, was really wondering just how this came about. <laughs> Because yeah. there was quite a, quite a bit of uh, uh, tendency to not invite, in, admit girls because they couldn't handle large animals and stuff like that. Well, now it's more than 50% female. Sure, right. And they do very well at it. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, Mary Beth has been president of the AVMA. Uh, what's her last name? I guess you've not interviewed her, no, have that's you? That's okay. What about the, mi the minority programs that you've got? What is that? My you have a minority mentor program. A minority mentor program? Right. And uh, then the Summer Research Apprentice program was another one I saw. Well, those are things that we started doing in the summertime to okay. give kids exposure. Sure. And to give our people in the vet school exposure to these other people to see right. what kind of individuals there are around. Right. Mm -hmm. Do you go to? Do you do any? Do the school do any recruiting within the state uh, for students? Oh like sure. Oh, and oh, oh. Well, well, I tell you, one of the things that I was involved in that I really liked, uh -huh. and that was 4-H Roundup. And and 4-H Roundup, of course, occurs every spring, and kids from 4-H come to campus, and right. then they sign up for, for classes and programs. And uh, every year that I was was able. Uh, I was signed up to to be included in 4-H Roundup, and and we we had a lot of fun. I had about 30, 30 kids sign up usually, nice. and uh, they would come to class, and I would provide each with a stethoscope, and then I would tell them, well now, um, 
if you're if you're actually going to be a doctor or veterinarian, you got to look like one on TV. So drap your drape your stethoscope around your neck, and then if somebody peeks in the door, they'll think it's a whole class of doctors. And when we go on a tour of the school, they'll think you're already doctors. So we did that, and then I had them put on the stethoscope and and listen to their own heart, listen to their breathing, talk to themselves, and so we had, we had a great great a lot, time. A lot of hands on. A lot. And you've been at the state fair too. The oh, school. every year we're at the state right. fair, and and that's just gotten bigger. You know, yeah, this those, year they had an extra and week. And do surgeries. There's a sure. there's a surgery uh, demo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you get that way you get all ages and you get them from all over the state and outside right. the state too. Right. And, and a lot of our recruiting is through veterinarians in the state. Sure. See, one of the things that is as part of the application process that we from the very beginning insisted on is that the kids have exposure to the profession so they knew what was coming. So they knew there are dirty cages, there are dirty stalls, there are messy things to do. And so it was, we, we required that they volunteer or otherwise have some activity in a private practice or in something related to what they want to do as a veterinarian. Yeah. And so uh, because of that, they made contact with practitioners. Well, that's not the only reason, because some of them just did it on their own. But they, they would spend time with the practitioners, the practitioners would get to know them, and they, they would... Uh, uh, they were they are great greatest recruiters right. now. Right, that's true. And and especially they, now they that we have a lot help of, me out or whatever. Right, especially now that we have Purdue grads out. That's right. Yeah. It was yeah. a little harder when there were no Purdue grads. <laughs> oh dear. Um, let's talk Stewart uh, the Stewart Co-op. The Stewart House. Okay, that was one that my daughter got me into. Our daughter Janice uh, is very involved in anything education. Uh, she's a sign language expert, and in fact, she convinced the folks in in, uh, in administration here on campus to uh, accept sign language as a foreign language requirement because they 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 said at first that you know it has to have a culture, and so finally she was able to demonstrate for them that there is a deaf culture that they use signs for jokes and for all sorts of things, and so now sign language is a, a a accepted for the foreign language requirement. So anyway, that's the kind of girl she is. So while she was a student, the co-ops were all having their usual problems with drinking and, and that sort of thing. And there was quite a crusade on to try to, to do something about that, in fact, through the Duna Students Office. And so these, Jan and, and her, about five of her friends decided there should be a co-op, which was Christian-based, which would not allow alcohol or tobacco in the house. And so they petitioned the Dean of Students Office, and indeed they got approved and they got a charter. And then the housing group uh, found a house for them that had been vacated by a boys' co-op on Pierce Street. So we, and anyway, what happened is Jan, they needed a spa, a, an advisor. And so Jan came to me and said, why don't you meet with us and and let us tell you what our ideas are and see if you're willing. So uh, we did that, and uh, I, I agreed to do it, and Jeannie was in agreement too, and so then I signed on as their advisor. So this was in the fall of 85, I believe, and uh, we put together a constitution. They assigned us the house on Pierce Street, so we were in there cleaning, scrubbing, painting, and all sorts of things so that the house was ready for a spring semester in 1986. And uh, so we had regular meetings and the gals had the thing going and they worked out all the things you have to do in a co-op, which is pretty involved, you know, with responsibilities for paying for things and especially the, the phone bill because that's before cell phones when there was a shared telephone. And there was always there were always need for rules and regulations and security was a big issue because the girls were pretty easygoing and trusting and didn't want to lock doors and so all those issues came up. So anyway, I was I was their advisor through those early growing pains and steps, but then in the spring, a little before school let out, my daughter was starting to get uncomfortable and the girls were starting to to bother her or bug her that things were too much going her way because her dad was advisor. 
And so here's that old parent issue all over again. So at that point, I bowed out. They, hire, they assigned somebody else as the advisor. So the spring picture shows somebody else as, as the advisor. But uh, I was the one that helped them get that going. When did they move? Now, uh, when did they move? Do you know? I don't know. It's been in the last five, ten years. Mm, not more than maybe five or yeah, so. Maybe five years. I think years. five because yeah. uh, since I, I banked, I always banked at that bank. And I, I think maybe six, but not any more yeah. than that. But uh, did they did they had they had to move because they did they have to move they had to find they a had spot? to move because that was that house was being torn down right and, and the of university. course the restaurant that was next door was going too and right. then ultimately the university took it over it's a parking lot now right right okay right. so so because of that university housing uh, the co-op housing sure. authority uh, helped them find a place and. That house became vacant, and so they moved in there. It's, it's, it looks like it's a little larger than it's, the house it's that they had. It's a much nicer I house. I may have driven by the original one, but only I don't go down. It never went down the street that often. Well, it's a much better. It's a much better house. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, in, in fact, the kids are still involved with it because just last year, Jan had us deliver a goodie basket to one of the current residents. Uh, so the girls who have finished and gone on, uh, they they kind of tend to look after the kids in there now. So we took a goodie basket over for one of the girls just this last year. Yeah, let's talk about family. Did do you have children? You have children? Did we we do. Jeannie okay. and I have been married since 1954. Okay. Our first uh, son is Jimmy. He was born the day vet school started, and he lived through all that with us very well. Uh, Jeannie worked part-time and finally uh, set up a child care business in her in our apartment so she could stay home with Jim. And then uh, we went on to California for the internship at the University of California and our, our second child, Jeff, was born while we were there in, in California in Davis. And then uh, we adopted a little girl in 19, well, let's see, she was born in 61. We adopted her in 65. Where, where did you adopt her from? Here, locally. Oh, locally. Yeah, Jeannie was very, very involved with uh, Carry Home for Children. Oh, okay. And at that time, children who were left alone because of their parents' problems, well, they were picked up by what was then child, what is now Child Protective Services, but there was no place to keep them, and so they put them in the county jail little kids in the jail and there were lots of kids who were at risk until they could find a foster Something. family to put them in so we started doing foster family work and Jeannie was very involved in, in all of this uh, and Jennifer came along and she had gone from pillar to post to family to family to family and How old was she, she? she was three at the time oh, my. and so we adopted Jennifer and she now lives in uh, Arkansas in Pine Bluff and she is a security guard at a prison there. Is she married? Uh, she's been married a couple of times. Okay. Uh, she, she, because of her early history, had a pretty severe, serious attachment disorder so it was hard for her to establish relationships and keep them. But now she calls she calls us every two or three days and we talk on the phone she for a while. And what about the one that was in the co-op? Did any of your children go to Purdue? Uh, yes, they did. Let, let me finish oh, this little sure. bit about Jennifer, and that is that now one of her children is in town, and she called today. To she just came to town. She called today to come see us in the next couple of days. So, and, and in fact, when she was born, Jennifer's uh, husband was in the service in Germany. So she called me. I drove her to the hospital, and I waited with her there uh, during the delivery. So that was uh, Lil Karen, and so that's Jennifer and her and her child, and then, and she has a son, uh, Kevin also, and then uh, back to wait, back to Jimmy a minute. He is now a vice president with Conagra, which is a very large large corporation, sure. and in fact he is in charge of their acquisitions, and their the removal of of units from Conagra. So when they sold uh, Swift. Or when they sold uh, Armor Star, then he was responsible for that divestiture. 
uh, and things of that sort. He's, he's very involved in that aspect of their work. Uh, and he has four kids. Then uh, three, I'm sorry, he has three children. And then uh, Janice uh, was born in 1966. And so she started, she is a really a Purdue kid because she started in Purdue Child Development in their, in their child lab. And uh, she's in one of their early films, in fact, uh, about the child development program. And then Jim and Jeff, or Jim and Jan were Purdue students. Jeff wanted to go to Ivy Tech, so he did that. So yeah, the Jeff, and Jim and Jan have Purdue degrees. That's good. And that's Jeff nice. has Ivy Tech degree. Yeah, that's very good. That's nice. Yeah, oh, that's great. It's fun, yeah. I tell you. Uh, were you ever a faculty fellow? Um, at any time? No, not a faculty fellow in any of the, do the university dorms and things. But what we did do is we joined the foster parent program, and we had a couple, several Indian families uh, who are now obviously, well, this was a long time back, but last year we became acquainted with some Indian students again, and now, well, they were here Saturday, in fact. Uh, some of the Is this kids. Uh, um, American Indian or I'm Indian sorry, uh, Asia Native. India. Oh, Asia. Okay, Asia. Yeah. From the country of India. Mm -hmm. So, so we have become very well acquainted with kids from India. Jeannie has learned how to do Indian cooking, and she's a pro at it. Oh, in wonderful. fact, in fact, last year when these kids first arrived on campus, she had them out and, and had a meal, and this little girl said, "You got to teach me how to do Indian cooking." <laughs> <laughs> This is a girl from India, mind you. <laughs> <laughs> that speaks well for them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, some of the awards and honors there, you, uh, that one you, I told you, you got the Teacher of the Year Award, but you're also a diplomat in the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine. Uh, yes, I am. And uh, also in the American College of Veterinary Dermatology, which is I, nice. Well, and I was he, a charter member in the, in the internal medicine group, and then because of that, we formed the dermatology group within the internal medicine group, and then when we got big and strong enough, we then asked for separation and got separation. So then there's the American College of Veterinary Dermatology, and I was heavily involved in, in the organizing of that. Okay. Any other awards and honors that you'd like to share? Well, I think the Norton Award I've, I actually got a couple of times. Good. And then there was an all-campus teaching award uh, one year. That was a few years back. And then also, more recently, right before I finished up and retired, I received the PLU Award. And what that is, is an award given some years and not all years to a faculty member. And that's by vote of grads over the years. And so I, I did that. I did get that teaching award. Did too. you so know I'm, that you were going to get it in advance? Was it a surprise? No, no. It, it was a total surprise. Uh, that's uh, we I went to the, ask that question. We went to the awards banquet. It was me that got called up, and I didn't know it. But in the back of the room, there stood all my kids from out of town. So that was a it was a real exciting time. It's kind of neat. It was yeah, wonderful. I like to ask that question. Yeah, and they're usually surprised. And they, or one time, someone said to me, "I was invited to this dinner," and I looked around the room, and there were some people at this particular dinner that normally don't come. You know, and uh -huh. clickety click. Got an award, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, that, that's been a real delight to me to get those teaching awards. Yes, and yes, that means a lot. Um, professional associations, you, you, you were the president also of the American College of Veterinary Dermatology at one time. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah so uh -huh. you've been pretty active in that. Mm -hmm. Okay, retirement activities, what sort of things? Well, uh, retirement activities. Uh, actually, my passion is this house and yard. Uh, and I am always looking can, for, for, some, for something to do. And, and Well, in fact, where you were sitting was the garage once. Wow. And if you look so out that window, you see the end of the driveway is sort of in line with you. Uh -huh. Well, we've curved it, but originally that came straight in here. Oh. This was the garage. Because you brought the car in here. We brought the cars in, and then we added that foyer and the, that garage. And then we changed the driveway around. And at that so the original part of the house is this part over here. It is, and okay. when in fact when we moved in, this was the garage. There was no door there to that part of the house. You went out a back door here, 
and then you went in a back door on that part. And so when the time came in the 80s, then is when we changed this to a, a nice room and, and connected it or opened it to the rest of the house. And he's lucky you have lots of property here. We, it's a wonderful place yes, to live. That's a virgin hickory woods over there. and. Oh, is it nice. Oh, you looked out, right. We did. This is a wonderful place to live in. It's so close to campus. Right, exactly. Do you have a favorite Purdue tradition? Favorite Purdue tradition. And I also ask for an outstanding event, if you have. Okay, well, let's see. Tradition. I, I think probably it, it has to do with our vet school grads coming back to our conference each year, and that group has grown larger and larger, and get to follow them, see what they do. And we've got a conference coming up very soon now. Uh, it's the always 50th the latter year part of one. September, isn't it? Uh-huh, the 50th year one, so right. it's very nice. It's going to be a big wind day this year. Uh-huh, that's it right. is. Yeah. So that's one of my favorite traditions. Right. But I have to tell you, too, that, that the marching band, uh, we got to know the rights pretty well because of the dogs. Uh, Mrs. Wright was band director out at Harrison, and she had sled dogs and a sled on wheels that m went in front of the marching band at, at Harrison. And I helped her with those dogs. And then over the years, she brought her dogs in to me. And so we got to know the rights very well. So the musical things on, on campus are also uh, a very, uh, very special thing. Very nice, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, your outstanding event? Outstanding event. I gotta think about that one for a while because there are so many. You can have more than one. Well, one of them was was the moon landing because of Neil Armstrong. Yeah. Uh, did you watch it on TV? Oh yeah, we did black and white. Uh, uh, Some articles I've read it was sort of grainy and didn't come in, but I could see it fine. Yeah, we and did. I didn't ever I was think of it in as. Living in apartments at the time and. Yeah, I didn't yeah, think of it as, as grainy yeah. or un unpleasant. I think it depends on where they're. I mean, uh, it, articles that I've read, some people that they interviewed and said that it but wasn't see. at all. No, I thought I thought that was was outstanding, especially because of Neil yeah. Armstrong. Right. Um, yeah. Although it was a great event anyway, but he made it better. That's right. Um, but he made it. <laughs> and, and then. One of the things that is not really an event, but that appeals to me a lot, is that Amelia Earhart was here. Uh, my granddaughters are just enamor enamored with uh, the story of Amelia Earhart. But actually, when I was a kid growing up, that's, that's when I started to get interested in airplanes and flying and, and that sort of thing. And uh, so I was really thrilled to find out that, uh, that she was here. In fact, I have my, my uncle back in Michigan, when I was a kid, he was postmaster. And there were, there were some first flights, air mail flights out in, around in Michigan. And he made up envelopes, stamped them first flight air mail, and then mailed them around the state. So I've got a co little collection of envelopes that were on first air mail flights. Oh, how nice. Oh, it is nice. Yeah, yeah, very yeah that's, nice. that's very exciting. Yeah. And then, uh, there was one that started to run through my mind as we were talking about that. Uh, oh, and that's getting my pilot's license because I did that here. Uh, I went to the ground school Purdue course as a Purdue student. I, you know, I enrolled in it as a Purdue student and took it with Purdue kids. And then uh, I took the flying lessons right here at our airport and then I did get a license. And you got certified to fly? Did you ever have a plane? No, I didn't ever have an airplane, but I, I do have a license to fly a single-engine plane. That's pretty good. I, I'm very pleased. You and Sully, Sully, uh, Sully can be, you know, together. <laughs> <Touch> <laughs> yeah, that's something that I wanted to do from sure. the time I was just a, a little kid. And, and, well, you know, that was during the war, and, and the exploits of the Air Force were most remarkable. And I just wanted to be a pilot in the Army Air Force. And, of course, the war ended and long before I got to sure. that point. But um, then I, I really went on through with the veterinary thing, which I also had always wanted to do. But then later on, Jeannie made it made it possible for me to take flying lessons, and so that's being close at hand, you could take advantage of it. Right, that's and right. that was very convenient, yeah. and it was a real thrill. Right. 
Uh, I think in closing, any closing comments or any special subjects you want to kind of close on? I'll leave it up to you. Oh, I think we've covered most everything, okay. but I just want to emphasize again the, the importance of the students, the respect for the students, for seeing them as adults and, and giving them experiences that really prepare them for what they're going to be doing later. So like I was part of that, at one point right after we first started, we didn't have a very large caseload and we had kids in the clinics. So I spoke to the practitioners in the area and asked them if they would take in the kids for say a day or two or a week. And so we worked out a rotation system and besides being in our small animal clinic, the kids were able to go to private practices and work, work alongside veterinarians here. And the practitioners in town, even though they weren't Purdue grads, were, were right. very, very cooperative and very helpful in that. All of them. Sure. All and it of gave them. them an extra pair of hands, too. It, well, it yep. did. But sure. at that point, these were kids just starting. Oh, okay. And so maybe they could hold something, but they weren't really trained yet at that point when sure. these guys agreed to do it. Now as the kids have come along farther and farther, then it does become extra. And in fact, from that, we evolved the externship. And so our kids now have a 12-month senior year. And there's uh, uh, blocks, there's 10 blocks. So there's, there's a block where they have vacation, but there's 10 blocks and they, they vary. And during the time that they are juniors, they have to line up an externship in, in, a, in a subject area that they expect to work in. So if they're interested in research, they have to line up an externship in a research institute. If they want to go into small animal practice, then obviously it's a small animal clinic. If they think they want to be horse practitioners, they've got to line up an externship with, horse with a horse practice. Uh, if they want to be exotic animal, then, or, or say zoo animal, they've got to line up an externship with, with that. Mm -hmm. And so what happens at that is that they get a fantastic experience in being responsible for locating somebody who will take them, for organizing it as an externship. Now that it's been done for years, the kid, everybody knows what externships are. But even so, they have to make the contact. They have to make the arrangements at a time that it can be done in their block. And so all of them now do an externship. And, and that, that evolved from this Thing rotation around practitioners. What is the, how long does that last? Oh, let's see. I think a block is five weeks. Oh, OK. And it's normally off campus, unless they're doing research, they might want to do an on-campus, It's right? very hard to get an on-campus block because we try to get them to go off campus, right. to go away, so that's part of the experience too. Right. That's a good, a good option to have. Well, well, that's the kind of thing that we have always been dedicated to is, is making sure they have experiences and opportunities and learning environments that, that will really really add to their education. Right. And broadens the whole scope of the education exactly. record, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Dr. Laker, I want to thank you very much. My pleasure. Well, thank Thanks. you very thank much. Thank you. <laughs>